flooding and further evacuations forecast for Gippsland residents. We're not taking anything from anybody, we're trying to give things back. The PM dismisses claims of an Aboriginal land grab. Alexander Downer assures Iraq Aussie troops are in for the long haul and the 12-year-old thrilling crowds at the US Women's Open. Hello and welcome to SBS World News Australia. I'm Amrita Chima. Residents of Victoria's Gippsland are preparing for more flooding in the coastal lakes area tonight. Flood waters have been met by a king tide at lake's entrance, leading to fears they may burst their banks. High winds have also been forecast for tomorrow. In addition to lake's entrance, the larger towns of Sale and Bairnsdale remain under threat from flooding. And emergency crews have evacuated all residents of Newry, with all roads to the town closed. This tiny township of Newry remains awash with muddy effluent. What didn't come through the roof, come from here, come both ways. After years of drought, Mother Nature's actions are almost too much to bear. The wall of water carving a path of destruction, claiming all in its wake. For town local Percy Gray, his newly renovated home remains in ruins. Just cut it really, like um, insurance, whether I can get a claim, whether I'll um, honour, I don't know, I'm just, what do you do? Streets have been turned into rivers. Locals are angry that authorities release thousands of megalitres of water to ease pressure on the Glen Maggie Weir. The surging water forced many from their homes evacuated to the local footy ground. At sale, residents woke to similar scenes, boat owners spending the night protecting their prized possessions. Water was basically through the house. We were sort of sitting in the lounge room with water, you know, so there's not much we could do. Well-known areas like these car parks turned into marinas, swirling floodwaters, swallowing roads and homes. Similar scenes about 50 kilometres further on at Bounsdale. It means a hell of a lot of work for a lot of people, basically. It's very deep. I've never been in a flood before and uh, it's quite interesting, quite scary. Yeah, it's just one of the things we've got to get on with life and get over it. We're here at Bansdale and as you can see, this is as far as the road will go. Behind me is the Mitchell River. Major flood warnings remain in place for the Thompson, McAllister and Avon rivers. But it's the communities right over on the other side at Lakes Entrance and Meetung that remain at the greatest risk of flooding from the Gippsland Lakes. Householders and local councils are counting the cost. This holiday village left unrecognisable. Prime Minister John Howard has already promised relief for all those affected by the floods. Anybody who um, has suffered serious injury, <coughs> excuse me, or whose home has been destroyed or rendered uh, uninhabitable for 48 hours is entitled to a special additional a payment of $1,000 per adult and $400 per child. Carolee Tulvan, World News Australia. And joining me now on the line from Lake's entrance is flood expert Professor Roger Grayson. Professor Grayson, you've been on the water at Lake's entrance. What has the king tide been like? Uh, look, it hasn't been as, as serious as uh, might have been first thought, uh, largely because it's extremely calm here. There's virtually no wind. Uh, so there's been no build-up of, of water and uh, the waves have, 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 not, have not eventuated. But nevertheless, it is a high water level. There's um, pretty much continuous water right through the bottom end of town. It's hard to distinguish the, the lake from the streets. And uh, there's houses that have had their, their floors inundated and lots of sandbags around town and so on. And it seems that all is not over as yet. What kind of problems are you expecting tomorrow? Well, uh, the, I was just talking to someone to our west, and uh, the westerly front is, is on its way, so there'll be some stronger winds, which will, will cause some issues. Of course, all of the rivers are still in flood and are still filling the lakes, so uh, there'll be rising waters on, on account of that. And then tomorrow night, we also have another fairly large tide. So, I think mean, tomorrow, tomorrow night in particular will be danger time, but all the time really between now and then. Uh, some, some more evacuations, I think, have been, have been requested in other parts of the town, so certainly the authorities are expecting higher levels. And this has been a very rough year for the people there, Professor Grayson. They had bushfires, drought, and now these floods. How are they coping? Well, I think at the moment it's a bit of a day-to-day -day, uh, exercise. But, I mean, the community's used to these sorts of things, just not everything in, in six months. And, uh, 
And on top of that, the fishing industry's had problems because the entrance to the lakes has actually been quite clogged and they've had difficulty getting out. Of course, this flood will, will open that up, but all of those things on top of each other, the tourist, tourist uh, problems and, and the fishing problems, uh, make it tough for the town, no question. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much, Professor Roger Grayson. Attempts to refloat the stranded coal carrier, Pasha Balka, will resume tomorrow night, three weeks after it ran aground in stormy weather. Last night's efforts to refloat the 40,000-ton vessel were called off after three of the six cables attached to the ship broke. It didn't take long for the salvage team to face its first setback. As the high tide approached its peak just before 7 o'clock last night, a cable connecting one of the three tugs to the Pashabolka snapped, forcing the Kira to abandon the operation. Efforts to refloat the coal freighter continued. As it bounced in a swell, things looked promising for a while. But by 9pm, authorities realised that there was no chance that the Pasha Balka would be set free. This morning, more bad news. Another two cables had broken. One between the ship and the super tug Pacific Responder, another tying the ship to the sea anchor. Even though three of the six cables were down and the Pasha Balka remained beached, authorities say it was a success to move nine degrees on the first attempt uh, is good progress. Uh, as I always said, uh, it is a flexible plan. It'll adapt and change to the circumstances. And circumstances mean repeating last night's efforts tonight have been postponed. If favourable weather conditions hold up as predicted, the salvage team will attempt to refloat the mighty Pashabolka in tomorrow night's high tide at about 8.15. But the delay doesn't mean salvagers have time to take it easy. They'll be working throughout the night to prepare the 40,000 ton freighter for tomorrow night's mission. And experts are still concerned concerned that the hole in the ship's hull may worsen with each attempt to pull it off Nobby's Beach. The 225 metre Pashabolka is holding 700 tonnes of fuel and 100 tonnes of other chemicals. A spill, one of the main dangers of this salvage operation. The International Transport Federation is also concerned that the Pashabolka was sailing under a flag of convenience. It wants the federal government to investigate. White got that ship up on the beach in the first instance. Uh, the, uh, again, the salvage operation is in professional Australian hands. Uh, the highest qualified seafarers in the world are working on this and we have all faith in those. But let's ask the question, why is the Pashabolka on the beach? Regardless of how it got there, the Pashabolka is, albeit temporarily, Newcastle's most popular attraction. Sarah Bamford, World News Australia. The Prime Minister has refused to guarantee that all land leased as part of the government's Northern Territory intervention plan will eventually be returned to Indigenous communities. But Mr Howard has promised compensation if the land is not handed back. One of the most controversial elements of the intervention plan is the compulsory leasing of about 60 Aboriginal towns and settlements. There are fresh accusations that the Commonwealth's pursuing a land grab. There is a great alarm in Indigenous communities that there is a hidden agenda here to take the Aboriginal people's land off them. The Prime Minister says that's ludicrous. We are leasing the land for five years, then it goes back. If there's any disturbance of title involved in that, there will be uh, compensation paid. But Mr Howard's refused to say whether all of the land will be returned. After the five years, are you offering a 100% guarantee that the land will go back? Look, we're, not, we're offering a guarantee that we're not taking anything from anybody. We're trying to give things back. The Greens say there are fears the government's trying to take over the land for mining and other developments. You don't override the Native Title Act without you have good explanation. And so far, the Prime Minister has outlined his action but has given zero justification. Kevin Rudd seized on a comment from a journalist that Mr Howard may be planning to extend the duration of the leases. He's now talking about five years perhaps being uh, an uncertain limit for the future when it comes to um, these other arrangements as they affect um, pre-existing legislation on land. The government's rejected that. The Indigenous Affairs Minister says opponents are trying to find any argument to undermine the plan. Where are they going to go next on this issue? They're trawling through land tenure issues, they're trawling through election stunts. Mr Bruff has been briefed by government officials who have visited six remote Indigenous towns. Tomorrow the task force overseeing the operation will hold its first meeting in Brisbane with the Prime Minister.
And next week, Cabinet will consider a crackdown on welfare payments as part of the intervention plan. The government wants to ensure parents spend some of the welfare money on food and clothing for their children. Mr Howard says the policy could apply to all Australians who receive benefits. There's a strong argument that those payments should be quarantined, at least to a certain level. It's likely to generate more heated debate. Richard Davis, World News, Australia. Foreign Minister Alexander Dano has assured the Iraqi Prime Minister that Australian troops are in his country for the long haul. Speaking in Baghdad, Mr Dano dismissed speculation that John Howard would announce a troop reduction ahead of the federal election later this year. The Foreign Minister, having wrapped up his tour of Israel and the Palestinian territories, made a surprise visit to Baghdad, where he told Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki that talk of an Australian troop withdrawal was just that. I made it very clear to the Iraqis while I was there that uh, we wouldn't abandon them and um, it was um, for us a, a very important component of geopolitics that extremism in, uh, in Iraq was defeated. The assurance follows recent opposition claims that some or all of Australia's 515 troops in southern Iraq would be brought home soon. Mr Downer says Labor has been saying it for political reasons. The foreign minister insists it's too early to say that the US troop surge to secure Baghdad and surrounding provinces has succeeded, as American troops are still being deployed. President Bush, visiting the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, said the surge was having an impact. On the ground, our forces can see the difference the surge is making. General Petraeus recently described what he called astonishing signs of normalcy. The deaths of three more British troops in southern Iraq, where they're under constant attack, will add to the pressure on the new Prime Minister Gordon Brown to speed up Britain's withdrawal. The troops were killed by a roadside bomb in Basra, bringing the British death toll in Iraq to 156. Ross Cameron, World News Australia. London police have defused a bomb in a parked car, preventing what's being described as a very serious incident. The vehicle was found outside a nightclub early Piccadilly Circus. It was packed with nails, petrol and gas cylinders. And police say it could have caused significant injury and loss of life had it exploded. The area was cordoned off, later disrupting morning traffic and the London underground. The alert came a week before the second anniversary of the July 7th London bombings, which killed 56 people. Coming up later in the program... This country has a, a bright future ahead of it. Tackling poverty in East Timor. Israeli President Moshe Katsav has resigned as part of a deal to avoid charges of rape. The Attorney General said it was important to spare the nation the sight of a president on trial. But rape crisis groups are planning a demonstration tomorrow to express their outrage over the agreement. Israel's Attorney General announced the plea bargain that would render the outgoing president disgraced but free from jail. An indictment will be issued against the president that includes indecent acts without consent by the use of pressure, which is a criminal act, he said. Moshi Katsav has tumbled from first citizen to convicted criminal by his own admission. But for more than an hour, the Attorney General tried to explain why the deal eliminated all charges of rape. We are talking about a criminal offence or an indictment which attribute to the president a chain of indecent assaults through a long period of time, he said. Moshi Katsav's attorney characterised the outcome as almost a victory, with the president taking responsibility for very little. Very minor sexual uh, uh, offences. Uh, it's uh, nothing like uh, what we heard and we saw. Uh, during the last uh, year in the media. This is one of the women who accused Moshi Katsav of committing rape. The offences that were committed against me are not part of this indictment, she said. 
thanks a lot for his admission, but he could have been punished in a more severe manner for the offences that he committed against me. As President Moshi Katsav had greeted heads of state and himself been greeted by a guard of honour. But women's advocates say it is rape victims who are dishonoured by this agreement. It gives a message to women that were raped or attacked or sexually assaulted by uh, men that are in positions of power that they, it's better for them to just sit home and be quiet and uh, not tell anybody about it because um, it's not worth it for them to actually even file a complaint in the police. The deal will be presented to Jerusalem's Magistrates Court on Sunday, bringing to a close the case and the career of Moshe Katsav. Prulawan, World News Australia. East Timor is gearing up for tomorrow's parliamentary election, which is expected to result in a change of government. Former President Shanana Gushma's party is expected to win the election over the ruling Fretilin party. And economic credentials are emerging as the main issue in the campaign. Scouring for their supper. Eight years after gaining independence, the majority of East Timorese are as poor as ever. According to aid agencies, one-fifth of the population remains dependent on food aid and 60% of children under five are malnourished. <coughs> one-year-old Sancha Sarmento is one of them. After two weeks of intensive care in hospital, she weighs five and a half kilograms. Her mother and father, like most people here, do not have a job. There are 14 parties contesting this election and each has identified tackling poverty as the main issue. But with unemployment levels of 60% plus and a rapidly growing population, there is no easy fix. You have a serious unemployment rate in the country we have, uh, which really needs to be addressed. The World Bank has been working with the government to address the issue, but with a low skills base and a highly centralised bureaucracy, progress has been painfully slow. In an effort to prevent corruption, the current Fretlin government has tightly controlled the decision-making and spending processes. It's one of the reasons for its current fall from grace. Former President Janana Guzmao's newly established CNRT party is widely tipped to emerge victorious from tomorrow's election. It is promising a radically different approach. CNRT's main platform is to actually uh, undergo a, a political transformation, a political reform. Uh, and, and we will do that by restructuring the government if, uh, and the structure of the administration uh, and decentralizing government not concentrating the power only in the hands of one or two people. Thanks to the oil and gas fields, East Timor has $1.6 billion in the bank and is earning an additional $100 million a month with the prospect of much more to come. Hope is on the horizon. This country has a, a bright future ahead of it. And nothing indicates that the Timorese cannot be a middle-income country within the next 15 years if the right policies are in place. But as ever, much will depend on the security situation in what remains a highly volatile country. In East Timor, Brian Thompson, World News Australia. It's seen as one of the last big tests of a changing China, full democracy for Hong Kong. Ten years after the Hong Kong handover from Britain, Beijing has still not allowed the promised one man, one vote. Stan Grant looks at just how important the issue is to most Hong Kong citizens. He calls himself Long Hair, Hong Kong's self-styled Che Guevara, still talking about a revolution. There will be structural uh, change in, in China, I, I'm damn sure for it. He's a folk hero here, a rarity, an elected politician. Only half of Hong Kong's Legislative Council is directly voted in. Ten years of mainland China rule has not tamed Leung Kwok Hung, not afraid to buck the system. Surely there will be a significant challenge to their party dictatorship. He's had his share of supporters this past decade. Hundreds of thousands of people have taken to the streets each year, calling for the right to full democracy. Hong Kong's masters in Beijing have turned a deaf ear. I don't think the Communist Party in China wants to relinquish power. And at some point, a confrontation will develop. 
How we survive it, if we survive it, that is the big question. The people of Hong Kong are supposed to get full democracy. It's provided for in the basic law, the mini constitution. But there's a sting in the tail. It won't happen until Beijing says so. If you have democracy in Hong Kong, and it is seen to be working extremely well, and Hong Kong is a thriving, prosperous city with freedoms and human rights and so on, then this would generate pressure within China. The people of Hong Kong could have an answer on democracy as soon as 2012. As a government, we are preparing to launch a three-month public consultation exercise on how and when we can attain universal suffrage. It's not whether to attain universal suffrage. Others say democracy is no longer so important. Locals more concerned with making money. If you do a survey, what are the issues that most people are concerned about? With democracy, one man, one vote, ranks way down there. In 1997, there were fears of Chinese troops on Hong Kong streets, a crackdown on human rights and freedom. It hasn't happened. China has pledged not to interfere here for 50 years. But the clock is ticking. Long hair hopes time is on his side. And Stan Grant will be reporting on Hong Kong's 10-year anniversary celebrations over the weekend. And still ahead in the news, she's just 12 years old, not yet in 7th grade, and cutting a dash at the US Women's Open Golf. Women's Open is underway and teeing off this year is a 12-year-old sensation. Alexis Thompson learned to play golf from the seat of a baby stroller and she's not the least bit phased by the sport's most prestigious tournament for women. If you haven't heard of Alexis Thompson, you will. We're all pulling for you. Alexis, or Lexi as she likes to be called, is the newest sensation on the women's golf tour. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This from a 12-year-old. What grade are you in? Going to seventh. You're going into seventh grade. <laughs> you know that sounds a little strange when you look around you. Yeah. Not yet in yeah. seventh grade. She is homeschooled, so she has time to practice. Lexi is the girl from Coral Springs, Florida, who likes ladybugs. But she's no kid on the golf course. She can already hit a ball 240 yards. What's the key to a, a really good Lexi swing? Tempo. <laughs> Tempo? Yeah. Grip the club, good grip. Keep the club square. Tempo, and just swing. Wow. Lexi began playing at the age of five, determined to keep up with her older brothers, 14-year-old Curtis, a rising star on the junior circuit, and Nicholas, now a pro golfer. And then there's her caddy, who happens to be her dad, Scott Thompson. I think it's hard being a dad and a caddy. It's a lot harder, harder than just being a caddy, so um, oh, it's pretty tough. You know, you're, you're feeling every shot with them. You know, you feel the ups, you feel the downs, so it's tough. This afternoon, Lexi played the first hole of her first U.S. Open, and then it rained. She's back at it tomorrow, hoping to keep her score low enough. I'm just trying to do good and have fun, and if I make the cut, it'll be awesome. Wherever she places, it is an awesome beginning to a very promising career. To the finance figures now, the Australian share market ended the day and a fourth straight financial year in the black. The market has added 23% over 12 months, its best performance since 1987. Improved commodity prices helped the miners, the banks were mixed, but Telstra eased. West Farmers, the only remaining bidder for the Coles Group, rose further. But so did Woolworths, which is reportedly planning a last-minute offer before tomorrow morning's deadline. In the region, Tokyo booked its highest close in a week. Markets in Europe are lower in early morning trade. Wall Street was flat after the Federal Reserve kept interest rates steady for an eighth month. And the Australian dollar is stronger against our major trading partners, except the New Zealand dollar. And in the commodity markets, oil has hit above 70 cents. 
to the weather now. Isolated showers in New South Wales with snow falling on the Alps. The rain is set to continue in Victoria, particularly on the south of the ranges, with isolated thunderstorms in the south contracting in Gippsland. In the major centres, sunshine for Brisbane, mainly fine in Sydney, showers for Melbourne. Across the Tasman, early rain in Auckland, sunny in Nandi and Christchurch, showers in Tahiti. In Southeast Asia, late showers for Bangkok, fine in Denpasar and Jakarta, cloudy with rain developing in Kuala Lumpur. Further north, plenty of rain around the region, showers in Beijing, Hanoi and Hong Kong, fine in Taipei. Heading west, fine with light winds in Baghdad and Beirut, rain in Islamabad, sunshine in Jerusalem, rain in Mumbai. And in Europe, sunny in Madrid and Rome, showers in Berlin, late rain for London and Paris, a grey day in Moscow. In Africa, rain for Addis Ababa, fine in Cairo and Casablanca, showers in Lagos, sunny in Johannesburg. In South America, a fine day for Buenos Aires, rain clearing in Caracas, late showers for La Paz, sunny in Santiago. And finally for North America, overcast in Chicago, sunny in Los Angeles, showers for New York and Toronto. And that's the news on SBS for now. You can always check out our website for more. That's sbs.com.au. Thank you very much for being with us. Enjoy your weekend. Good night.